Welcome to the Crowd Crux Crowdfunding Podcast, where we talk about everything you need to know to run a killer crowdfunding campaign. My name's Sal Brigman, and thank you for listening. If you guys have any questions, comments, you'd like to reach out, you can always hit me up on Twitter. My handle is at S Brigman, S B R I G G M A N. Today we're going to be talking with Josh, the founder of Morpho MFG. His company functions as sort of a middleman between the inventor or entrepreneur and factories in China that will eventually mass produce the product. Morpho MFG helps with the design of the product, helps you create a 3D model which can then be turned into manufacturable files. They help you in getting your prototype, which you can use in your crowdfunding video. And they also help when you need to scale up with the large scale manufacturing of your product. The company claims to have helped over $3 million worth of crowdfunded products, meaning people who have been successful on a crowdfunding site like Kickstarter or Indiegogo, and then have come to Morpho MFG uh, wanting help with the manufacturing side and getting that product into the hands of enthusiastic backers. I'm going to start by asking Josh a little bit about the, the origins of his company and why he's decided to work with entrepreneurs who have successfully raised money via crowdfunding. Okay, cool. Yeah, so um, we're a pretty new company. Uh, I actually, I moved out to China about three years ago and uh, I went to something called the Canton Fair and it's basically, it's kind of like CES, it's like where all the factories bring their products kind of to show off and, and get new buyers and so I've always been into business, I've always been into product designs and I, I just thought that would be the perfect place to, to get started and start learning about how China works and uh, so I did that and um, when, once I once I started learning a bit more, I realized that I could help uh, some of like my my closer friends and, and family with some of their ideas. So we started small, and uh, it, it just I, we've kind of been able to ride the crowdfunding wave with all of the different opportunities that there are, and uh, we've really been able to grow with that. So in the last probably six to eight months, uh, we've really started taking it seriously. Um, we have now we have ten. Uh, 10 employees that work for us and uh, we have an office in two countries. We just set up an office in India to help us uh, with our design and, and our marketing efforts. And um, yeah, so basically what we do is we're kind of like a, I guess you know Foxconn, right? Mm -hmm. So, so we, uh, we play that type of a role as a contract manufacturer. So instead of, we don't, we don't actually own the factories just because of all the upfront overhead and capital that that would take. So what we'll do is, using Foxconn again as an example, is they'll take the iPhone, and the iPhone obviously has a lot of different moving parts. And I mean, like you have the button, you have the screen, you have the camera, you have the case, you have the cable, you know, there's so many different pieces. And uh, what most people will do when they, when they start trying to work with China is they'll go to one factory and try to get them to do all of that. And we'll break that up. We'll break the products up into as many different pieces as we can and find um, specific factories to work with on each, of those fac on each of those pieces. So they're specialized with each of those parts. And that guarantees a few things, all of which are very important to new business startups and, and people with new ideas, innovative uh, products. Mm -hmm. First is uh, quality. You know, it's kind of, I, I use like an analogy, if you go to like uh, a restaurant and they serve pizza and sushi, it's probably not like a super high class joint, right? That's a good point, yeah. Right. So we do the same thing, you know, instead of going to one factory that makes plastic, and get them to make the entire product, you break it up, and we use only specialized factories. So that, that's the first part, is just guaranteeing quality. The second part is price. You know, we cut out, we cut out all of the extra middlemen, we go straight to the source. And then the third part, which 
probably arguably is the most important, especially when you're talking about China and a lot of people are worried, is uh, IP protection. Mm-hmm. And so if you, if you send your design to one factory, you know, you're going to have copied of your products out on the market, pirated mm-hmm. versions of your product in like three months. Mm-hmm. But what we do is we break it up and nobody has the entire design in their hand. So instead of uh, one person having the entire design, we work with our customers to prepare a strategy to keep that design out of as many people's hands as possible so that people don't even really know the end vision of what they're working on. They just work on their part, make it perfect, and then uh, it goes on to the next step of the assembly. Mm-hmm. Now, I see on your website, you also, you guys help with product design or helping create like a 3D model of the product. Um, what point do you think a creator should begin approaching you guys? Is it when they've had a success on Kickstarter and now they need to deliver the rewards? Is it months beforehand or even in the idea phase? Um, um, I mean, it can, it can work anyway. I think, I mean, from my, from my perspective, um, the best would be, would be to come, you know, once you're, you're set up with your Kickstarter. You know, ideas aren't worth anything these days, right? Mm-hmm. Like, it, it doesn't, you know, everyone has a good idea. But you need to design it. Not, not anything like hard, like a, a really intense graphic or manufacturable design files. But just to get it out there and make sure that people actually want it. And so if, if our, our, our ideal customer is somebody who's come up with a great idea, they've put it up on Kickstarter or Indiegogo, and uh, then... You know, that they've, they've seen that people want to buy it. And then when they do that, you know, they come to us and it's a, a lot further down the road because they know that people are willing to buy it, so they're willing to spend a little bit extra money. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I'm definitely a big believer in paying for your services. A lot, of, a lot of people, before they have the money that crowdfunding can offer, are kind of, to just to be honest, kind of cheap, right? They, don't, they can't afford it. They're not certain about what they want to do. And, uh, you know, if you, you pay, I mean, in any industry, you pay, you get what you pay for. So mm-hmm. I think once you have the money and you can, you can put it and show that you, you've actually come up with something reasonable that people want, um, you know, then you move on to that next stage. So you guys really focus on sort of deconstructing the product and then figuring out the most efficient way to manufacture it and from which plants. Now, if someone was looking to create like a prototype of the product, um, should they approach you then um, for help? Or is that something sure. they can figure out on their own? Sure, yeah. I think um, prototype, prototypes, you know, it's pretty, it covers a pretty broad uh, area. You know, I mean, there's prototypes that I can make, you know, in my office. And then there's prototypes that need, you know, like a, a circuit board, for example. You know, nobody can really make that in their office. Um, so it, it, I guess it depends what stage of the prototyping. I think that anyone should come up with their, their basic prototype um, by themselves and, and kind of figure out exactly what they want. Mm-hmm. But I'd say probably 30% of our customers don't have a design. And so they'll come to us with, with some pictures and an idea and say, this is what we want. And usually, you know, unless it's uh, too too much like an episode of the Jetsons. We can usually figure it out for them. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, so you guys have worked with a lot of projects, um, from what I've seen, and uh, I've gotten a lot of positive reviews of you too. Um, maybe you could talk a little bit about from having dealt with people who have launched successful campaigns or now in the having to deliver this actual product to a group of backers. Some of the mistakes that you'll make or misconceptions that people have about manufacturing when they're just going into the process? Okay. Um, Probably the biggest misconception that people have when they reach out to us is they're concerned about quality in China. Mm -hmm. And uh, so people will come to us and say, you know, we want to make it in China, but we're worried that China only makes low-quality goods. And if they'd come to me 10 years ago, that would have been absolutely true. But practice makes perfect, right? And so these Chinese manufacturers have been working on their specialties for the last 10, 15, 20, maybe even 30 years. And, and so the real, the real problem is that people don't really know what they want. 
you know, I, I explain it like this. Obviously, there's a big cultural gap um, between Western mindset and Chinese mindset, and that, not even the language, you know, just the way that we think. And, um, you know, if, if you want, if you want your, your perfect product to be X, Y, and Z, you need to make sure that you're, you're explaining exactly the functions of what X, Y, and Z are. And, and what, you know, I mean, you can't over explain things in, in the manufacturing industry. Like, there's really no way that you can give me too many details. Mm -hmm. So, I'd say that's the biggest mistake is just that people don't give enough details. You know, there's nothing that's too obvious that you shouldn't tell me. Mm -hmm. Don't leave anything up to chance. Don't let other people use their imagination. In other words, <laughs> right? Yeah, exactly. And I mean, if you do that, you're going to get up. You're going to get a very high quality product. You know, I mean, Apple manufactures here. Some of the best companies in the world manufacture here, and it's kind of it's kind of like the end of cheap China. You know, if you want to make cheap goods, you go to Vietnam or Bangladesh or Cambodia or something like that, right? The, mm -hmm. This is now the home, the hub of the highest quality goods in the world, I think. Mm -hmm. At least, point. especially for electronics. Mm -hmm. So, um, if, if you're sort of just starting out as a creator, um, looking to create a new product and trying to figure out in the future how to scale it up, um, what are sort of, in your mind, some of the first steps that someone would take? Would it be deconstructing that product into the various components and then trying to find uh, the best manufacturer for each one? Um, would you worry about IP from the onset? What sort of, um, from, from the get-go, the steps would you take um, if you're just starting now? Just getting, like, you have an idea and you don't know the next step. Let's say you have a prototype that you've made. Okay. Yeah, I mean, ideally, you, you, you want to be in touch with somebody like us. Um, because most of, like, I have one customer, they actually found me through your guys, your guys site. Um, they're called Anymote mm -hmm. and we're just starting to work with them now. And they're, they're all like software geniuses and, uh, they have a, a really strong background there, but for hardware, um, I think that, you know, that's something that they, they they've been working on perfecting. And so they came to us just using as an example saying, can you help us with this? And, and basically they broke, they deconstructed their idea into ideas. Mm -hmm. And they said, we want this part of the product to do this. We want this part of the product to do this. We want this part of the product to do this. How can we do it? And I think that that works really well. When you don't know, ask questions, right? Mm -hmm. And so anybody, you know, we're, we're open to anyone asking questions to us and helping out whether they're our customers or not. But uh, at that stage, especially if you're in a, in a field where you're not super comfortable with the product you're making, you just need to ask a lot of questions. Mm -hmm. So if you have your prototype, most of the time people will have a prototype, but they just won't be ready to manufacture. Because, I mean, it's a big difference. A lot of people, I think, kind of think that you have a prototype and then you give it to the factory and say, all right, let's go. But, you know, that's just not really realistic. Especially if your campaign is a campaign, you know, that all of a sudden is doing six or seven figures mm -hmm. and you, you have to do thousands upon thousands of units, you know, then, then you really need to make sure that your, your supply chain is all set up and that, you know, everything's good from, from day one, right after you end that prototype. Mm -hmm. If you were in the sort of do-it-yourself mode and you're trying to deal with a Chinese manufacturer on your own, are there any really big things that you should be looking out for? like? Should you be taking a trip to China to try and, you know, talk with the manufacturer in person or um, for someone who wants to deal with the manufacturer on their own, what would you recommend? Um, yeah, I mean, it's tough because if you, if you go straight to a factory, um, they're usually, you know, they don't understand you. They don't know who you are. You have no sort of respect. You have no credibility, right? You're just coming to them with a new idea. And I think most of the time, corners are going to get cut and you're going to end up with something that you're not happy with. Mm -hmm. um, so you can, you, there's definitely things that you can look for. Like Alibaba, I think, is a big no. And I know most people are probably really curious about that because when I first came here, Alibaba was you know, really starting to pick up and I thought that's just where you went. But 
the truth is is that Alibaba, probably 80% of the, the factories, like in quotation marks, aren't really factories. They're just middlemen. Mm-hmm. And so where, you know, I think if you're trying to work direct, you're going to find problems. I think you need to work with a middleman, like a contract manufacturer. Mm-hmm. But if you're going on Alibaba, you're working with another Chinese person. So it doesn't, it doesn't really connect. It doesn't really bridge the gap there. Okay, I see. So I, I would definitely, one of the biggest things in China is called guanxi, and it, mean, it means relationship. Mm-hmm. And uh, basically, in, in China, if you want to manufacture anything, you need to have the relationships. And if you don't, you know, you're, you're, there's just going to be so, so many problems that you don't even foresee before third. Mm-hmm. That's even much harder with the communication barrier there. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, China's, in the last five years, they, their English has picked up tremendously. Mm-hmm. But it's, it, it's a problem on that level. But it goes a lot deeper than that too, right? And it's the communication isn't just language; it's the entire thought process. Mm-hmm. So I'm sort of I'm curious. You know, you've explained a little bit about why um, you're focusing on crowdfunded projects. Um, why, you know, obviously the the inexpensive aspects of labor in China, and you guys have figured out a way to sort of systematize delivering quality to your customers. Do you see any advantages or disadvantages to going with China? Um, should everyone automatically, you know, consider China and not consider anything else? Or what do you think on that aspect? Uh, I think it depends on what industry you're going into. I think if you're doing electronics and you're not doing it in China, I don't know what you're doing because I, I, I wouldn't even know what to do really. Um, some industries uh, like textiles for example um, where you can kind of get a leg up if you go to some of the smaller southeastern southeast asian countries Mm -hmm. and then there's obviously you know like i'm actually canadian so it's not as big of a deal for me but a lot of americans are really pushing the pro america support the economy support american manufacturing type thing Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm no economist by any means, but in my opinion, the way to support the economy would be to, to build a big company, right? And, and the best way to do that is by making sure that your company has good margins and a quality product so that you can rehire and, and bring more talent onto the team to help you grow. Mm-hmm. That's a good but, one. Yeah, I, I guess disadvantages of China. Um, it's it's a wild it's it's a totally different beast. You know, if you don't if you don't know what you're getting yourself into, you're gonna end up coming coming out totally confused. Mm-hmm. Um, before we talk a bit about um, you know someone who's looking to purchase your services and what that would be like, um, I want to sort of get a little bit more into um, IP protection. So. Say someone's, you know, an American inventor, you know, they have trademarks, they have patents in the U.S. Um, will that uphold in any way in China? And is that something they should be concerned about when they're going to manufacture their product there? Um, in terms of copyrights, you can basically throw them out the, the, out the window. Um, you know, like I said, it's a whole other beast. And, you know, if, you, if you're going to come and, and try to sell a factory, this is my copyright. Obviously, if you're Apple or you're Dr. Dre Beats or you're Bose or Sony, or if you're a big company, international uh, international law can be a little bit more respected. But you're, if you're a small company and you're just doing your own crowdfunding thing, you know that's just not going to work. Mm-hmm. And so that's kind of why we one of our we, we do three startup fees um, for for different kind of tiers basically. And one of them is called the IP Protection Pack. And we developed that entirely with innovative crowdfunding founders in mind. Because, you know, the, the fact is, is that China still copies a lot of stuff. And if you do something that works, you should probably expect that someone's going to copy it. Mm-hmm. And so what we do is we, we hold that, that time frame back for as long as possible. So, if, I mean, if you do release your product and it's really popular... All it takes is one person to buy it, bring it over, reverse engineer it, and, and they can make it, right? Mm-hmm. But if you get to that point, you're, you're with a very successful company. Mm-hmm. Like, two examples, actually. Beats, 
like Dr. Dre beats, they're fake. I see them every day, probably 10 pairs, just everywhere, because they didn't do a good job of protecting their IP from the onset. And I'm, I'm pretty sure that they probably gave their product design to way too many people. Mm-hmm. Whereas Apple, you know, Apple's the, the, the richest company in the world, right? And they, you know, you'd think that they'd be the most copied product in the world. And people try, but they fail because they've done such a good job of setting that up from day one. And so, you know, if you're, if you're coming in with an innovative, new, electronic, high-tech product, you definitely want to be able to set that up from day one. Mm-hmm. So, uh, yeah, I'm looking at your website. So the IP protection package, that's the one you're referring to. Um, there's sort of the, these other lines, the engineering consultation and lifetime sourcing. Maybe you could talk a bit about um, what you get under those also. Sure. Yeah, we've actually just redesigned um, our site. I'll, I'll, I'll send you a link right now. We've changed some of the tiers in, in the product pricing. So now the three tiers are basic IP protection pack and concierge. Mm-hmm. And so the, the first one is, you know, if you just have a one type, one product, you have something that you want to get out and get it out the door, we can help you with that with a brief introductory call, some quality control, make sure that things are set up and make sure you're working with people that can be trusted for price, high quality, and lead times, which is another important thing for crowdfunding, obviously. The middle one is the IP protection plan, which is um, basically just protecting like I, like I mentioned earlier, by breaking the design files into different pieces and making sure that uh, you diversify your supply chain to make sure that nobody has everything in hand. Mm-hmm. And then the concierge, which is the highest tier, um, also includes an engineering consultation and lifetime sourcing. So engineering consultation is basically um, if you come to us with a prototype and some kind of rudimentary uh, design files, we can help you to tailor those to make them ready to manufacture. There's a big difference, obviously, between a prototype and, and ready to manufacture mass produced files. And so we'll, we'll help our customers to get from A to B there. Mm-hmm. And then lifetime sourcing is just, if you pay the highest tier, um, you're basically a customer for life. Um, so some people, you know, if they have one product and they come out with another product idea, we would charge them again. But if they go with the concierge tier right from day one, we wouldn't recharge them for any of their new products. Awesome. That's great. Yeah, it is, it's, it's, I think more and more customers are going for that just because with crowdfunding, people are, you know, these are some of the most innovative people in the world. And, you know, you know that once they do one successful campaign, they're going to come back with another one in another quarter or maybe half a year. Yeah, I, I've certainly seen people um, do a lot more multiple crowdfunding campaigns or even release just accessories for their existing products. So, yeah, totally. Um, I think that's a pretty good value, what you guys got there. Um, I, I, yeah, I mean, it's so hard running a crowdfunding campaign. You have all of these components. You need to figure out marketing. You know, you need to do a great video. You need to come up with compelling copywriting to describe the product. Um, you know, a lot of times you include images in your campaign, manage it, and then finally at the end when you think that, you know, I put in all this hard work and this is the result, you have all of this money in your bank account that now is going to go into actually making the product. So it's a, it's a whole, I think, diverse array of skill sets. And I think what you guys are providing, it's, it's pretty um, critical. And uh, yeah, I, I'm going to encourage people to, to check out your website and I'll be sure to include it on my um, blog post that the podcast is featured in. Great. Um, awesome. Well, yeah, thanks so much for providing some insights into manufacturing. Um, is there a good way that people can reach you, or should they go to your website? Is there a contact form or something? Yeah, so we're, we're just redoing the site, and there will definitely be a, like a reach out, give us your email and contact. Um, I'll give you the link. Um, to that and also you know they I, I'm super open with people just sending me kind of blind emails my email is josh at morphomfg.com so if anyone has any questions you know I'm, I'm more than willing to, to field any question that people have okay sounds great 
Uh, so Josh at MorphoMFG.com. And uh, I'll be sure to also include that in the blog post. So great. thanks so much. Uh, it was great talking with you this morning. And uh, I look to look forward to seeing how you guys progress over the next few years. I think you guys are doing some great work with crowdfunders. Great. Thanks a lot, Sal. Hey, guys. Thanks for listening. I hope the podcast and this episode was helpful for you and your campaign. Please take a minute to leave a review in the iTunes store. And I encourage you to reach out to Josh if you'd like to learn more about Morpho MFG. I'll see you next time.